Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm talking with Joey and Roger about how photographers can test their own gear at home. We test hundreds of lenses a day in our tech room, and getting that done requires some pretty in-depth training and some pretty specialized equipment. But you don't have to study for years or spend tons of money to do some basic tests of your own at home. Just about anyone can test their own lenses and cameras with a bit of know-how and the right setup. To tell you how, here are Joey and Roger. Joey, Roger, welcome to Lens Reynolds Podcast. How are you? Hey. I'm good. Yeah, what's the... How's it going today? It's Man, right. it's hot. It, it is, is hot. very hot I'm in a... Memphis currently. But I'm going to get that second booster today, so what up? Yeah, Joey's yeah. getting boosted up. I haven't gotten my second one yet. Just, uh, you know, so everybody feels sorry for me, I drove back from the beach to do this podcast, you know. Oh. Yeah. oh surely not exclusively for this podcast. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, I got a ping to start off our conversation with... Uh, you know, something that has nothing to do with the topic of this podcast. That's what we do best. I got a ping saying that you were clearing out your office and looking to give away a bunch of stuff. That's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And mentioned that some of it was Star Wars related, and I want to know what's up for grabs. Well, <laughs> I um, want to know what I can steal from your office. Jimmy has swooped in and got the half life size Darth Vader already. Oh, that thing's awesome. I knew Jimmy would beat me to the cool. Yeah, step. Jimmy was over there like banging on my door at, at eight o'clock this morning. Jimmy has an Emperor Palpatine tattoo, so I think he's established his bona fides. He's got some precedence. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's a, uh, I do have a signed Darth Vader helmet. Signed by who? The person who played Darth Vader. The like actor in the suit or James Earl Jones? No, the actor in the suit. The actor in the suit. I, I can't no, remember I, that guy's name. Daniel I, I, something? Something, but I ain't, I ain't got no James Earl Jones. Props Man, that's pretty <laughs> cool, though. It is All pretty right. cool. Well, I assume that's going with you. No. Is that up for uh, grabs? I, I will no take room. that. I will Rochambeau you for that. Okay, you me guys and Joey this will, out between you. I, a tease for the listeners. Me and Joey will rock, paper, scissors yes. at the end of this episode. You know what will appeal Hammer. to our listeners, though, is, uh, as you know, I've got a collection of really old lenses. Yes. Yeah. We're trying to figure out what to do with these. So if anybody has any ideas. Wait, are you giving us. those away? The marketing department may want to do some stuff to. Uh, I will actually shoot them, though, like with them. Most of these are like, you know, uh, box camera kind of things. You need plates. Oh, you've got that shit, don't I've you? I've got all yeah, of that you do. shit. I could actually okay. use your lenses. Yeah, well, I, I've actually yeah. used to go, I used a 1905 Protar and actually did MTF bench on it. What? Seriously. Yeah, we did. Maybe we do cool. like a blog article or something. Like yeah. shooting all of Roger's stuff. Of, of all, there's one lens I won't give up. I you can have, take a picture. You can take a silver plate portrait of me in that Darth Vader helmet. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that would yes, work. that's happening. I have an, an actual Harrison Globe lens. You know what that is? Oh, fuck. I don't really? know what that is. Yeah, what is this? Um, well, they were trying to make wide angles. You're talking about 1850s. Okay. And there were no wide angles to speak of. And some dude named Harrison went, well, if you look through a snow globe, it gets really mm -hmm. wide angled. Mm -hmm. And so he, they didn't actually, they cut it in half to try to make a lens. Right. It ends up not working but he made a globe shaped lens the two halves separated and it was probably the first wide angle of any use it wasn't great but God. compared to nothing but uh it's pretty cool it's pretty cool all yeah, right those well, are awesome if any those listeners have any idea on what we should do with all this stuff that would otherwise be going nowhere let us know all okay right. moving right but along. this is not what we're talking about today <laughs> what we are talking about today do we is, ever talk about what we're talking we about, have really? to at least mm -hmm. open with some useless bullshit okay yeah what we were talking about today is how our customers can kind of test their own lenses at home which is a this is a question we get a lot because we do a lot of lens testing i venture to say it's something we're known for but this does involve you know on our end some specialized equipment that not everybody has access to. Uh, right. So we want to kind of cover, you know, what, if anything, you can do at home. And this is something that I am not familiar with at all. So I'm going to be asking you guys a lot of questions, not contributing much. And I think it's important to point out, I wrote a blog article one time about how I test my own lenses. I've got a lab with a million dollars worth of testing equipment in it. I don't use it for my own stuff. Right, 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 right. It's great for automating testing procedures for our gear. But as far as testing my own lenses, I do it at home like everyone else could. And even in our case, testing our own gear, the expensive stuff, the complicated technical stuff is not in large part used to individually test lenses. It is to do standards. And then we also can, having those standards, we can basically screen uh, a lens. We've, we've 
tested it. We've got a numeric representation. We can retest that lens frequently and go, it's not changed. Right. That's the biggest thing for us. People don't it happens all the time. Somebody rents the lens. I dropped it, but it's fine. And then we test it. And, well, no, it's not fine anymore. It's changed. Yeah. But as far as, like, when I buy a lens, use new, get one out of our shop, whatever, I don't put it on all that lab equipment. Uh, not going to lie, I do use our test charts. Like, uh, I bring well, my stuff in and use our test charts. Yeah, <laughs> we, well, we have, a, we have a test chart that we have made. It's right. proprietary. Uh, that's probably better than, you know. Than most. Yeah. But yeah. – Regular test charts, well, that's a, a good thing because I'm going to start with what do you not do. Okay. And my first, what you don't do is go in the basement or the garage and shoot a 2D test chart because, <laughs> first of all, if you don't do that, we'll save about 72 billion electrons because just people go online every day and go, here's my test chart pictures and I think something's wrong and 72 other people go, oh, those are awful and 162 people go, oh, that test's not valid and – Right. They're right. It's not that you can't do that. You just can't do it like people do, which is I'm going to go in the basement and take a picture of my test chart and then look at that and go, hmm, it's good or it's not good because you haven't got a clue. Right, because it doesn't matter unless you have a baseline and you've tested a bunch of other copies on the same chart, know what you're looking at on the chart. And not only that, but 99% of the people who do that take an autofocus picture of the test chart. Yeah. And so what you've done is tested your camera's autofocus system. But you haven't tested your lens. Nope. So like if oh, you're gonna yeah, that has not occurred to me. So you need to be manually focusing so you can at least make sure your focus gauge is about right. You or, need to more than that focus bracket. Okay. So you're manually focusing, but you don't sit there and go, Okay, here's the sharpest center. You go, here's the sharpest center. Let me go past that till it's blurry. Mm -hmm. Let me take a picture, another picture, another picture, another picture as I go back through the sharpest focus till it's blurry again. Then you look at those pictures. Yeah. And first thing you do is not go, how sharp is it? You go, okay, this is the sharpest center. Is it also the sharpest edge? It won't be. Probably not. It will not be, yeah. So you go, okay, here's my sharpest left edge. Is it also the sharpest right edge? That's it Probably won't be. And then you can go, okay, instead of putting that center picture with the sides are fuzzy or the right side's fuzzy because I have it lined up perfectly because you can't. You may think you can. You can't. No. You go, okay, the left side comes in focus here, the center here, the right side there. Oh, I've got a field tilt. Mm -hmm. Or more likely, I'm lined up wrong. Right. And then you correct that. And then you've learned something, not just is my lens sharp. My lens is sharp, and it has a field curvature, right. which most lenses do. So when I take a picture of a tree in the center, the best focus at the edge is going to be closer or further than the tree. And this is wide open. Yeah, this is wide open. Yeah, you always test wide open. Why do you always test wide open? Because if something's wrong with your lens and you stop it down, you can't tell. Now, that brings another qu question, though, which is next thing I do on my test chart, if you want to do test charts, then I start going, okay, here's my sharpest edge. Let me start stopping down. And at what point does it get as sharp as it gets? Because if I'm in the field and I'm going, you know, I want a sharp across the frame picture and the edges are as sharp as they get at 5.6, mm -hmm. that's where I need to shoot. Not 12, right. 11, 16. Right. All I'm doing then is making the center blurrier. Yep. Diffraction. So that's testing to actually learn something about your lens, including is it okay? But your point you were making, Joey, earlier, I think, was is if you give me a Canon 85-1.4. I can test it and go, it's within the range of all the other 85 14s I've got. Nobody at home gets to do that. No. So the question at home is, is it sharp enough for what I want to do? Yeah, your sample size is too small to make Yeah, it. but is this lens good enough? Yeah. If it's really not what you expected, you might send it back and get a second copy. Sure. If, if two of them aren't, well, the reviewers you're reading were full of shit. <laughs> and it's time to think of something else. That's really true. You can't read or watch a YouTube video and believe it. And so you've got to have some some chance to go, is this what they say it is as far as what I thought they said or what it really is? All of the money. And that means taking some pictures and seeing do they come out like you expect them to. Right. right, which is kind of a basic question I had. Like to what degree is it even important to technically test your lens with, say, a chart if you know, you're not sure one way or the other if what you're seeing is going to come through in your final images? I think there's two reasons to chart test. Neither of them are – you could do it by shooting, mm -hmm. no question. 
But if you chart test, it's quicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's more controlled. It's a great way to go, something's wrong with this lens. Something easily identifiable. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, the right side is horribly blurry no matter where I focus it. It never, when I do that through focus test, it never gets sharp. Okay. Why go out and spend a day in the field with that lens? It's not okay. And I could do those through focus tests in 20 minutes. So yeah. I think that's worthwhile. Right. The other thing is, Unless you shoot the same thing. If you're a portrait photographer in studio, well, then great. You go do that. But mm-hmm. most most people use their lenses for different purposes. And I can set up some things to go. My, my favorite is the online forum that starts with, I got such and such, and it's got horrible bokeh. And I'm like, where? Because that changes. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Foreground bokeh is different than background bokeh. Edge bokeh is different than center bokeh. Bokeh at 80 yards is different than bokeh at 10 yards. So it's real easy for me. I have a string of little, you know, LED Christmas lights. Yeah, we do the same thing for our, like, YouTube lens tests. Right. Mm -hmm. So easy to go, okay, if I keep the out-of-focus highlights in the foreground, they're gorgeous. Don't put them in the background. Takes a lot of picture-taking to get that information, and you could do it in, again, a couple of minutes. You don't even need a picture. You can just look at the viewfinder and do that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That reminds me of uh, we had a guy that rented a, the, that old Nikon 135 DC lens. Oh, yeah, yeah. And kept complaining. Like, he complained over and over about how the bokeh is ugly. And that's how the lens was pretty much known for not having that well, phenomenon. here's why it was ugly. Uh, when I finally got the lens back here and tested it, the first thing I noticed were two gigantic fingerprints on the front glass ah. that show up in out-of-focus Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing mm-hmm. like lines. So he was seeing, <laughs> seeing his fingerprints. own fingerprints yep. mm. on the lens. You know, a, a similar thing to that. I have people who go, the, the, the bokeh is ugly, and they've got a filter on the lens. Well, then take it off. Yeah, because the filter may not affect your sharpness in focus, but it may well, especially if it's a longer lens, if it's right. 135, 200 and up. Very common. It gives this busy bokeh pattern. No, your, your filter gave the busy bokeh pattern. Yeah, and I guess guess the benefit of doing all this testing at home is so you don't, you know, find the stuff out when you're, like, editing a wedding or something. Exactly. And and like the thing I brought up earlier, if I know the lens has field curvature, that can be kind of hard to find out in the field. But if I know it's there, I can frame my shots accordingly. Right. Um, But if I go out in the field, then I've got to – I've really got to screw around for a while to figure that out. And if I know it to start with. But one thing about the field that may be important, again – a lot of people. I did 47 hours of testing on my lens in the basement. That's and too what much. the complete sentence is, is at 12 feet distance. Right. <laughs> because what happens at this distance may be very different at that distance. A lot of lenses are sharper at infinity than they are close up or vice versa. Yep. Or in the mid-range. There are some, some of the Zeiss are famous for being really sharp in the mid-range and fading at infinity. There's a There are several Leica lenses that are optimized for certain... Yeah, exactly. So it, it requires you take it out and do what you're going to do. And again, if you're a studio portrait photographer, then you need it at whatever you shoot at, 30 sure. feet, and cool. But if it's your walk-around lens, it's probably best to know <laughs> that when I take a picture of the building, the edges aren't going to be in focus, or and that's also very useful. A lot of people talk about it being a negative thing. No, when I take a picture of the pretty girl, the buildings are out of focus. That's cool. Um, it's just knowing your tools. Yeah, and I've taken some some cool pictures, and I'm not a great photographer, but when I know a lens has bad field coverage, I had one lens I kept forever that had a big tilt, and the reason was I would put the focus in the right side of the field and blur the rest of it all the way out to Hell the left yeah. side, and it was really kind of cool looking, and it was a neat effect, and people would go, how'd you do that? And I'd go, well, shitty lens. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, lens is broken uh, in exactly the right way. It is, but knowing what the lens did, I took advantage of it. Yep. Anyway, that's that's kind of my rant about um, chart testing and basement testing. Brick walls are good as a chart, maybe better. Yeah, because then it, you see not only uh, your sharpness, but you can see your distortion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, why is that? Uh, can you give me a little bit more detail? So when we talk distortion, we're not talking about perspective distortion. We're talking about geometric distortion. Okay. So a brick wall provides a nice grid, like straight, straight lines. And so... Pers- uh, Geometric distortion on a lens is either going to be barrel or pincushion. Oh, I see. So convex or concave, yeah, kind of. Or something okay. in the middle for some of those weird lighting. Like the 
old Nikon 1424 has like the mustache distortion. In it. That's yeah. famous for. Okay. Um, but you can see that on a brick wall really easily. Yeah. And gotcha. That most, makes sense. Most test charts don't have a – people have grid test charts, but most sure. test charts don't have that. No. Right. They seem to be – correct me if I'm wrong here – mostly like radial kind of? Yeah, they sh- they are, but they probably should be angled. Okay. Because – one of the other things that happens is astigmatism. Gotcha. Most of the charts you see, we talked earlier about we have our custom-made chart. Most of the charts you see have a horizontal and vertical bar thing coming together. Neither of which show astigmatism because astigmatism is radial from the center to the corner. So mm-hmm. on our charts, those decreasing width line, whatever you call them, sure. are rotated so that they are on the radial horizontal or um, tangential axis so we can t- see astigmatism. And it really makes it very clear on on astigmatic lenses. Yeah, and not only that, but sometimes the bad lens, the most subtle finding is an increased astigmatism. Yep. And when a lens usually doesn't have it, and you see one that looks pretty good, but it's got astigmatism, that that was that's a really kind of red flag thing for mm-hmm. us. Or if it's got astigmatism on one side, not the other, or reversed, that's real cool. You see, yeah, that is too. cool. On the right side, the Tangential lines are out of focus, and on the left side, the, hor- the radial lines are out of focus. And you go, okay, there's a wrongness here. <laughs> Nobody designed that. So is there a particular chart then, either like chart type or specific, you know, brand or model that you would recommend for people home testing? I mean, the old standard is the ISO 12233 chart, which is kind of what ours is based on, but ours is highly modified from it. Okay. But if you want to get that chart, and then take those corner targets and rotate them. Cut them out and rotate them. Yeah, cut them out and rotate them so that one axis is radial and one of the other axis is tangential. Radial being pointed from the center to the edge, tangential being right angles right. to that. Then that should, that should work really, pretty that's well That's basically that. what we have made. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, a lot of people print their test chart at home. That's cool. They print it on their inkjet printer. That's not. Right. Because your lens, even an average lens, is going to out-resolve your print. Yep. So there's a reason when we have ours printed on Linotype and we pay 280 bucks a piece at our cost. Right. Or the ISO 12233 chart costs up to $600 in a large size. Right. right. That's why. Yeah, they have to be printed at a super, super high resolution. Yep. yep. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get, like, it's worthless because the lines won't be separated. Now, here's my secret. You know my secret? It's, yes. It's a good secret. You can buy that, you know, 60-inch chart I talked about for 800 bucks. Mm-hmm. You can also buy just that, and I, I don't, I'm blanking on the word. Ryan, maybe you can throw it in in, in post, but the, 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 the curved decreasing line corners of the ISO 1, 2, 3. Oh, great. Okay. Right. So just the target. Sort of the, like, cross-shaped yeah. thing that's on the so corners. What I'd do is I'd get me a nice 12-inch one of those printed at high quality, Eight by or ten by twelve inch maybe or twelve by twelve sure. inch. I get five of them. Yeah, make I, your own chart. Put one in the middle, four in the corners, and guess what? I can also then move those corners out. So if I've got a wide angle lens on my uh, twenty five foot away wall, I'm filling the corners, and if it's a telephoto, I bring them right in. It's way less expensive. Oh yeah, that's Super a cheap. good idea, and it's way more useful. And so I, you know, slap a little Velcro on the back of them and, you know, yeah. boom, I'm on the wall. And, okay, I got now I've topped my 16-millimeter lens. Now I'm going to 35. Well, I just slot my charts in a little bit. Speaking of which, we haven't really talked about that. All the stuff that I talked about earlier was for testing my prime lens. If you're testing your zoom lens, mm-hmm. you got to do it about three times. you got to do the wide, the long, and in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. And most people go, well, the middle is numerically halfway between the edges. Don't do that. Look at your zoom ring and do it halfway of a turn because mm-hmm. that's when your optical elements have moved the most. So you will often find, well, I tested my zoom in the middle. Well, great. How's the long end? Sucks. Yeah, because you didn't look at that. Um, and zooms, you're never going to get them equal. So right. first of all, if you want to test zooms until you find one that's equal at both ends and in the middle. Good luck. I've tested, I guess we tested maybe 14,000. Sure. We saw one once. That was kind of close. It was pretty close. It was a 7,200. So one out of 14,000, you're going to have to do a whole lot of Amazon exchanges. Yeah, they will always be a little different. (laughs) They they do. And 
a lot of them are designed that way, um, particularly if you've got like 1635s or wide ones. They are never going to be as sharp at one end as the other. Uh, they can't make it work. Right. Those wides are typically optimized for the wide end. Yeah. And 7200s are the only ones that tend to be best at the long end. 2470s right. are usually better at the wide end, too. Almost always, yeah. Um, when you get up to five or eight time zooms, well, they're never that good anyway, so they're, who cares? Just don't test <laughs> yeah. it. Don't worry about testing it. Yeah, I get all day. I want a 10x <laughs> zoom that's sharp throughout the range. Well, so do I. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I want Santa to bring me a new Mercedes for Christmas. It ain't happening. Right. I want to seize the means of production, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's not happening. But, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's not necessarily about finding a perfect lens or fixing your lens if it's a little bit softer at one end or the other. It's more about knowing right. and using it within the perfect conditions and knowing the limitations. Well, you know, I had my set of lenses, and one of the things I see all the time, I've, everybody's got – or not everybody. A lot of people have a 1635, mm -hmm. a 2470. Mm -hmm. And they're shooting 35 with a 1635, and it's awful. And their 2470 is sharp as hell at 35. Yep. Why aren't you changing? Yep. So that's another thing that testing your lenses shows you is where do I lose? And I have to know my 1635 is good to about 26. All right. And then it falls off a cliff. Right. I bet most of the people who have one in their bag don't know that. Nope. Because they haven't done any testing. No. I can take a picture at 35, but I can take a much better picture if I swapped over my 2470. Right. Oh, that's important stuff to know, and that's why I test. Okay, we'll take a quick break right there, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about home testing. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. So for people who, you know, hobbyists, anybody who doesn't necessarily want to go out and spend $600 on a chart and light it, because that's something we also didn't cover, that it adds a million wrinkles to this whole thing. You have to light it really evenly, which is very difficult to do. Yep. So for anybody who doesn't want to step through those larger hurdles, what are some tests you can do at home without any specialized equipment? I mean, beyond the brick wall thing, which we kind of covered. A brick wall or a large building are, mm -hmm. are great targets for that kind of stuff. Um, field of grass or gravel is my favorite. Yeah, field of grass or gravel with like a slight incline. Yeah, that's even the best. Like a little if you've hill. got a little hill, we've got – if I had to do – if you told me I've got five minutes to test this lens, mm -hmm. I would go behind our office. There's a little hill of just grass. Mm -hmm. And I take two or three pictures at different – zoom ranges to get like close on the hill, middle of the hill, back of the hill, take them in, throw that card in my computer and do a find edges filter on it. Mm -hmm. It tells me that, Ooh, I mean, it's an amazing, here's my field tilt and curvature. You can just go, it's wow, funny. look at this. Um, with the zoom, it's particularly quick and useful because you can see where the field curvature and tilt changes at different zoom ranges, which it does. Yep. You can see that, Oh, the left side sharp and the right side never is. <laughs> So that's my five-minute test that I do. If I had nothing else I can do, that's my test every time. Gravel works. Uh, grass works. Mostly Anything with like a lot of edges. And a lot like of edges and a fairly uniform you know, field. Right. Um, the other thing I would stress is uh, this is typically manually focusing these lenses. Absolutely. If you insist on doing autofocus, the first thing you should do is figure out if your camera can do contrast detection only. Mm. Right. Um, and if it can't, then you need to dig in your manual and figure out how to do an autofocus micro adjustment on that lens before you do anything else. Yes, which is something I almost put in my outline on how to cover, but we I'll link to the blog article instead. We have covered this so much on the blog. Autofocus micro adjustment is probably yeah. one of the most common things we have to walk people through. Yeah, when I used to do tech support, I wrote that blog article because I was really tired of answering that question. Yeah, and it's an old one, but it hasn't changed at all. But it's, it's the most common issue. People are like, this lens isn't sharp, and we get it here, and I put it on a chart, and it's sharp as hell. And it's just because they didn't microfocus adjustment. Didn't yeah. do the microfocus and there's still some, and I'll, I'll 
be the first to admit they're mostly my age <laughs> <laughs> who go, I didn't pay $800 for this lens to have to microfocus adjustment. Well, you know what? We don't have your camera to adjust it. And that's <laughs> bottom line. And that's what I, I love. One guy who came out and was like, the quality control that this manufacturer has really gone down. I've had to micro adjust my last three lenses. And I'm like, what is those three lenses got in common? That would be your, your camera. camera. <laughs> no, so. Right. Yeah. It's not necessarily a flaw. It's, it's just, just what it yeah. is. It, it's like buying an expensive knife and be like, I didn't, I got to sharpen this knife. Right. And the range on all those adjustments is plus or minus 20 in each, 20 in each direction. And I love it when people are like, well, it was a plus 17. So I think this is a bad lens. No, that's within the range. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's there. And it's, it's easy. It's very easy to do. Uh, again, it, it's kind of too much to go into for this episode, but I will link to the blog article where we wrote about how to do it. So if you're interested, check the show notes. Uh, you can read about that. And truly, you can – if you know what you're doing, you can knock out a lens in like five minutes. It's not hard. Oh, it's yeah. super easy. Very tops. And, and that's the other thing about having an outdoor place you, you, you know. I did my microfocus adjustments forever. I had a, a gravel path behind my house. Mm. And I – Put a couple of big rocks in the path. And I was like, boom, boom, got it, done. Yeah, It's just so simple. Yeah. If you want to be real precise with Sigma lenses, though, they actually give you the distances they want you to do it at. I have a little side gig where locals will pay me to do their lenses. And, uh, you know. It, Not I, after they hear this blog post. I mean, I've, I've told every single one of them, I will just show you how to do this so you don't ever have to pay me again. And most of them are like, I don't <laughs> care. It's worth, it's not you worth my it time. It's the word micro. Maybe. People are in, it sounds more difficult than it is. But with the Sigma lens, especially the zooms, I get a laser, a laser ruler. Yeah. And I set up, I'm like, okay, well, that's one, that's 0.99 feet. This is the right distance. And I got my little target and I do all the things and I, and it takes me like 20, 30 minutes to do it. You know, that way. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the Sigma adjustment thing and, and their, their dock. Yeah. What, what do they call it? It's not a dock. It's a, yeah, they call it the, is it dock? I think it's their yeah, USB dock. It's yeah. just a USB dock. I've, I've had somebody who actually complained to me about, well, you have to do their zooms at three different zoom ranges. And I'm like, uh, four you, actually. You, yeah, but you get to. Because the other zooms also are not accurate throughout the zoom range. They just let you fix it on theirs. Yeah, Tamron calls it the tap-in console. Yeah. It is more accurate. And, you know, given that, if you're going to micro-adjust mm -hmm. a lens that doesn't give you all those options, right. do it at the distance you're most likely to shoot with because it's not going to be accurate throughout the entire zoom range. Right. And if you're a working professional and you have multiple camera bodies – yeah. You're going to want to label that lens to the body you are matching it to. And most bodies now will allow you to adjust per body, correct? They will. And so if you're using like Canon brand lenses with Canon bodies, you can adjust all your lenses to all your bodies. Yeah. But if you're using Sigma lenses and you're going – Sigma and Tamron lenses through the dock, you can make that adjustment one time for one camera. And it's not going to necessarily be your others. And it may or may not work with the others. Very good point. Which, you know, the the degree to which that matters depends on the lens and the camera, what kind of photography you're doing and the specific. Yeah, most people that are shooting with two bodies are putting a dedicated lens on each body. Like I have a couple of clients that I, I label them with a colored sticker, like red dot lens to red dot camera, blue dot lens to blue dot camera. And they know that. Mm -hmm. But I've told them, look, if this camera goes down – you cannot use that lens on your other camera. So well, just you, keep that in you mind. You can, but you'll lose a little something. You may not be accurate. I think that's most critical. And, and again, the two camera person, the sports shooters who need to nail center focus Every time, all the yeah. time. They really need that. Yeah, they uh, absolutely do. Again, you know, walk around Roger or I probably don't need that kind of accuracy. But Yeah, but you're working sports photographers. You're working portrait wedding photographers, especially the wedding photographers. Wedding photographers, yeah. That's um, huge. You got that's my most of my clients are wedding photographers. Yeah. Mm. That brings me perfectly to my next question, which is you know, if we're talking about a chart test, which again not all of our listeners will be doing, but if you know, that's the bar we're clearing here, how often does someone need to be doing these kinds of tests? Is this like a before you shoot every job thing? No, like it's once when you year? first get the lens. Yeah. Right. And then every time you drop it after that. That makes sense. Hey, if you're if you're a working professional, you're probably a little rougher with your gear than you think you are. Could be. So yeah. I'd probably do it every six months. That's possible. Okay. It, you know, one thing we've seen, and again, we're doing these lenses. We're testing them on 
you know, quarter million dollar machine that keeps their numbers from time to time. Mm-hmm. And we did this when we started this. This is eight, nine years ago. We would pull up lens 721734 and look at its 32 tests. Mm-hmm. And they would be identical until there was also a note from the intake inspector that, oh, it came back with a dent yep. and or a bent filter ring or something. And then, boom, then the optics changed. Yep. But until then, and most of our lenses go two years, and the optics never change. Right. So a bang will do it. Uh, some can. It, obviously, it could happen over time. We just don't see it. And we test these lenses Let's say three times a month for a couple of years, yeah. and they don't change. It's usually not a gradual thing. If it if it changes, it's it's because of a, because of some incident, and it's usually and it's not always our customer. It could have got dropped in shipping. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But it changes, boom, this day, and it doesn't change at all for weeks on either side of this day. So something happens. So then, in a lot of our testing, the first thing we catch is not an optical problem it's usually and we covered this in the last episode it's usually you know like the filter won't thread or some sort of small physical um yeah the visual inspection is the first thing yeah if there's any kind of red flags then so what then you know if there's one thing that a professional shooter should just like run like a pre-flight checklist almost with their lens before they shoot anything like a quick just kind of physical check what would you look at? Yeah, same thing we do every day. Um, just do a physical look at every part of the lens. Check all your rings. Make sure they're moving freely, not grinding, not jamming. Um, check your tripod rings. Make sure those are moving freely. Check your mounts. Make sure there's no obvious damage to those. Um, check your filter threads. If you've got filters, um, look at your front glass, look at your back glass, blow them off, clean them off, um, and then mount it to your camera. And again, first thing when you mount to the camera is you, you, you ran the, the focus ring through manual. Mm-hmm. Remember, for a lot of lenses nowadays, that didn't do anything but turn the ring because it wasn't mounted to the camera. Right. They're, they're focused by wire. So then you run through your rings again. Yep. Uh, if it's got an image stabilization system, you listen to that. Yep. And you look through the viewfinder and see, is it working? Yeah, just stick your ear to it. You'll hear it turning on and off. Mm-hmm. And then run through um, each aperture set. Yeah, make sure the aperture is working because most apertures these days are electronic. Yeah, and and you know one thing I always tell people that it wasn't apparent to me for some reason for a couple of years when you like stop the lens down, you see that it stopped down. Most lenses you can then take off the camera by pushing the dismount button mm-hmm. and leave the aperture closed, mm-hmm. right. and you do that and look at the aperture blades. Right, you're checking a bent aperture blades. Or we've seen a couple where one aperture blade ain't moving. Yep. Yeah. And it's not a little circle. It's a circle with a wedge on the side. Yeah. So that's important. Yeah, and make sure the blades are clean. Uh, make sure they're not melted. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and here's here's a, another thing. Most people don't know this. Is, this is a cool thing to me. You've got your camera set up, and you autofocus on something, this tree. Then you take the focus ring, and you move it to infinity, and autofocus back to the tree. Then you take the ring and move it to as close as it'll go. Autofocus back to the tree. You may find it autofocuses well from near to far, but not far to near or vice versa. And that's a subtle thing, which is not a good thing. No. Something's no. not right. Something's wrong. Something's going on wrong when that happens. What would that be a symptom of? could be a focus motor problem. It could be a cam or a rod in the focus system that's a little yeah, Like a out. registration error. So when you get to, when you're coming from near to far, there's a little something that's kind of hesitating it, mm-hmm. but not the other way. Mm-hmm. There are a few lenses, particularly some of the cheap primes, you know, I'm talking about the $180 to $230 primes. They are more accurate in one direction than the other. Yes. But it's still something to check and to know. Because if I'm going to move from walking around and I know it doesn't go from infinity close very well, I may want to always rack it to close when I start. Right. So that, that's a subtle thing, but a really good thing to check. Nice. All right. Then, yeah, and beyond, like, you know, the general optical characteristics of the lens, any major optical problem will likely come up if you run through that sort of, like, physical check carefully. Oh, yeah. I think another thing that really helps that uh, – no, I don't think a lot of people really think about if there's a local camera group or a photo club or something, go hang out with them because other people in that group probably have the same lens you have. And if you're worried, 
if it's normal or not, there might be five other copies you could just go look at. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about we have the advantage. We have a hundred of these lenses. We can tell when one's different. You don't get that at home. But if you go to the camera club, yeah, you can. Yeah. You can. I'll add not to – again, we try to make these not commercials. But if you call us and are like, hey, I'm noticing this. Is this normal for this lens? We have tested probably – Hundreds of copies of whatever lens you're talking about, and we will been be made happy in the last to decade. You. Yeah, and so we can look at that and be like, yeah, it typically is this soft at this range, or no, your lens probably has a problem. Right. At least two of our uh, our tech support people tested lenses for years before they were tech support. Yeah, yeah. We we don't we don't bring them off the streets and throw them in the tech support. Booth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they got to earn their stripes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we'll be happy to help if you got any questions. All right. I think that's helpful. Hopefully. I yeah. hope that's helpful anyway. Is there anything else we want to cover before we get out of here? I think that's about it. It really is, except um, people ask about how do you test use camera equipment, and that is you go take some pictures. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're testing cameras, press all the buttons. Yeah. <laughs> and look it over, make sure there's no cracks, no dents. Yeah, we focus mainly on lenses here, but yeah, uh, I think we covered a lot we, of that. We, we do use cameras. Do, In, do bring a sensor loop if you have one and check the sensor. Yeah. Uh, scratches. Know, scratches. Unfortunately, those are not cheap, a sensor loop. Yeah. I don't know. They're only like 50 well, bucks. On the flip side, like with, a, with a mirrorless camera, yeah. any kind of magnifying thing, you know. Yeah. I guess that's true, yeah. And if you own a camera, it's probably worth taking a look at a sensor loop. Oh, you should have a sensor loop if you own a camera because that's they're not how that, you, What are they, 80 bucks? I thought I thought the ones we have are like, from Visible Dust are like 30 or 40 bucks. Is that all? Yeah, they're well, cheap. Then, yeah, everybody should have one. Never mind. Maybe I'm overestimating their value due to how much seriousness we put on because keeping track of them in the Lund Journal's office. You, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> if you I, I must own, have just assumed these things cost a thousand dollars. I mean, mine's had my name on it for you know 11 yeah. years, so you, you we know, just keep track of stuff. It's not the thousand dollar stuff we lose. Yeah. It's the 16 megabyte memory right. cards. Right. That's what we can never yes, find. Exactly. But if you own a digital camera, and that is all of our listeners, most likely, yeah, uh, you should learn how to clean your sensor. Yeah, it's it's not sensor hard. Loop. It is not dangerous. You're not going to break anything. But you need a sensor loop. You need a blower. You need a couple other things. And that's it. You need to read this blog article we're going to link to in the show notes. Oh, yeah. We got that, too. Yep. I'm going to throw one thing out. I think everybody should have a sensor loop. Everybody should blow off their sensors, maybe even have a sensor brush. Sure. If your sensor is stabilized and you have any question about your own delicacy of hand, I'm not sure I'd wet clean my sensors very often. Um, you haven't seen me clean a sensor I know, lately, have I you? <laughs> well, I was thinking of cleaning sensors when I brought day. this up. <laughs> There are definitely people who have not broken their sensor but have messed up their stabilizer right. with over-aggressive wet cleaning of their or, – or Always be gentle. Yeah. So on the other hand, most of the time, I, I literally with my cameras hardly ever go past the, the brush and blow. As long as you keep up with it, you're yeah. probably never going to have to go past that. If yeah. you need to wet clean, I mean, you want somebody to walk you through it your first time, but you don't want to push down on a sensor very firmly if it's stabilized. If it's not stabilized, yeah, you can do what you want. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing people need to realize, we may get cavalier uh, about some of this stuff. You have a camera. You may have two cameras. The guy who cleans sensors in our place may clean 100 a day. That's so easy. Right. You, you get to where you think, oh, it's easy because you do 100 a day, whereas right. most of those folks out there aren't going to do it 100 times in their life. We've put our 10,000 hours in here. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I'm i going to repeat. I, I think if there's an IS unit in the sensor, a stabilizing sensor, yep. um, and you're not comfortable, don't, don't mess with it. Right. And some of those cameras have a sensor lockup option, mm -hmm. but not all of them. And – have you if you've taken them apart and you see the lockup, it's a little plastic. I figured it was pretty flat. thing. You know, again, I, I don't want to discourage anybody from doing something, but I wouldn't boldly go where you've never gone without an experienced person at least talking you through it right. or looking over your shoulder. Right. Yeah, but you're not going to damage the sensor with any amount of blown air or any brushing. Nope. You're just not going to do it. So that's spare game for anybody anytime. Yep, I agree. Beautiful. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for coming in. Hey. Hey, anytime. Fun. Can I go back to the beach now? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I'm going to get boosted. All right. Have a good time. I would time. rather go to the beach than the beach. <laughs> I'm just saying. Thanks for listening to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. 
Make sure to check the show notes for all the blog articles we mentioned, especially that one about autofocus micro adjustment. It's super important, and I promise it really is easy. As always, go to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, I'm talking with Memphis-based concert and commercial photographer Nathan Armstrong. His concert photography portfolio includes artists such as Paul McCartney, Taylor Swift, and Jennifer Lopez, and his corporate clients include Nike and Ford. We'll talk about how to build an effective commercial portfolio and how to shoot some of the biggest stages in the world without frying your camera with lasers on the next episode of the Lens Rentals Podcast.